They don't ask your name. They say, what do you need? Ah, that's just been my biggest takeaway from this trip. The willingness, these people have gone through so much and the first thing that they think of is, what can I give you? Back in August, I sold my business, my aquarium service company that I had for the last four years. Before COVID started, I had been planning a trip to go to Asia and do some backpacking just kind of around the world, kind of like what I'm about to embark on. And COVID happened, as it did to everybody. So I just dug back into my business and I grew it to the point where I was able to sell it in August. And then as soon as I sold it, I started looking at birthright trips. It is basically a free trip that Israel provides for 10 days, flights, food, many attractions every single day. It was a hustle and bustle. That 10 day trip is how I got to Israel. And that was in the middle of March, around the beginning of April. My parents came for 12 days. We did another full grand tour of Israel. We rented a car, we drove around, we spent probably four or five of those days in Jerusalem, had a great time there. The one city we did not hit was Tel Aviv. After my parents left, I stayed in Tel Aviv for a couple days and did some work. And then I went to my friend Tomer's house, who I met on Taglit. I was able to leave a bunch of stuff at his house for this camping trip, stuff that I wouldn't be using while camping. Yesterday, I took a bus to Tiberias here I am today doing the Yam El Yam across Israel. While it doesn't look like it, I am about half a kilometer away from the Sea of Galilee right now otherwise known as the Kinneret, and it is in the northeast of Israel. And there's a famous trail in Israel called the Yam El Yam, which takes you from sea to sea, which is what Yam El Yam means. The Yam El Yam is about 75 kilometers long. I know it's about 50 miles. Uh, right now I'm walking at the riverbed just near the Kinneret. I couldn't quite make it there because the brush got a little bit too heavy. Now I'm gonna follow this river for all the way up a mountain where it originates for about 25 miles, 20 miles. Then I'm gonna go down. This trip's gonna take about three days. It's Friday and it's also the start of Passover. So there will be very little resources for this weekend. There's also Easter weekend, a lot of holidays, everybody's off school. So all the campgrounds are booked, hoping to be able to find some primitive camping. Let's go. Look at all of these bananas, wow. These are just beautiful. I've been really amazed with how much agriculture Israel grows. This is where I'm heading, up that mountain right there. We'll see how far along this, uh, this banana plantation goes. Looks like it'll be about half a kilometer or a kilometer of bananas. It looks like I'm catching the lower elevation of this trail in the later end of its blooming period. Some of the flowers are starting to die, but I'm hoping that when I get up higher, I'll, I'll go through like a full range of different blooms of flowers. I am hiking this trail in mid-April and I would recommend doing this trail in March or April if you're gonna attempt it. Uh, another time you could do it pretty much all winter long, just have some better cold weather gear. It's been in the like five to 10 degree Celsius range and in the 30 to 50 degree Fahrenheit range in the evenings. So you would definitely need a sleeping bag and probably a tent would be advisable too. I've met a lot of people hiking the Israel National Trail. We're actually doing the entire thing without a tent. One of the things I really like about the Israel Trail system is their trail markings. These trail signs have a lot more detail in them and it's so easy to do. They have a lot more detail than the American trail signs. You see, this one is telling me to go right at this intersection just based on the right angle of the sign. So I'm gonna head this way through this culvert, I don't know what you would call this, under this bridge and start going upstream. I just stumbled upon this huge column coming out of the ground. Looks like it was probably originally part of a mountain next to it. But this thing is about, I know the perspective is a little weird here, it's about 80 feet tall I would guess.
Even though there's no one in this cave and there's no fire lit, the smell of smoke is emanating from this cave and you can see at the top how much soot there is. I bet hundreds or thousands of fires have been lit in there and it would actually be a really good sleeping spot. I accidentally bought sparkling water. I should have known because it's Coca-Cola brand and it's not Dasani. Lesson learned. Just these first two liters will be sparkling, of course. I'm quickly realizing that this entire path is a riverbed hike, and I know I kind of introduced that in the beginning, but I thought that there would be kind of a trail along the riverbed, and it actually seems like a lot of this trail is hiking in the riverbed, which leaves for zero stable footing. Uh, I'm, it's still very doable, but uh, it makes you a lot more tired. Definitely gonna hurt my feet more at the end of the day. Uh, but I'm still all in the shade since I'm hiking in the valley here. Also, all the rocks in this riverbed are super rounded. They're all really pretty. So you can kind of appreciate each one on its own. And I've seen about 10 hikers so far and just two or three groups. Everybody was really nice. I'm just starting to go on the uphill part here. I know I've been hiking up the riverbed the whole time, but it is going to get more steep as I go. I, I won't get up the entire river today. Tomorrow I should get to it around 10 a.m. I haven't really seen any great camping spots yet, so I'm a little bit nervous about that. I might have to stay at a more established campground tonight. I hope that there's room available there. If there's not, I'm not sure what I'll do. That's why I was trying to avoid that, but it also seems like I could probably just camp even without a tent somewhere if I could just find a spot big enough to set my, uh, my sleeping tarp out on. Having some bomba for breakfast. Bomba is this delicious, uh, basically puffed peanut butter in Israel, and you can buy it in America too. But it's bomba is from Israel. It's quite popular here. It's like the Lay's potato chip of Israel. It's at every store. It's right at the front, and it's delicious. And it's actually not bad for you. It's, it's I wouldn't call it healthy, but it's a healthy uh, snack. Healthy junk food. Oh, this is what they look like. Yeah. Oh, I guess it's like the consistency of a puffed Cheeto. Now, before I get too far into this video, I just got to give like kind of a disclaimer here that I, I'm sure some of my opinions, my political or whatever kind of opinions will come out during this video. And this, this country is at the intersection of the three of the world's most important religions and everybody's trying to coexist here. Each one has their own idea of the history of what happened here, how we should move forward, whose land is it currently. Some people call it the West Bank. Some people call it Israeli territory. Some people call it Palestine on the east of Israel. There's all the, there's, there's much uh, dispute over what to do with the Israeli settlements. The point of this video is not to uh, really pay attention to any of that stuff, actually. I mainly want to talk about just the nature here, but I also want to talk about how this nature exists now, how it did in the past. How Israel is able to develop these places is political in some sense. There's one undeniable thing about Israel, though. You can go from a thriving metropolis of Tel Aviv, which is akin to New York City, and in two hours, you can be in the desert, in the Negev, and in two hours, you could be here in this lush forest. So there is much beautiful nature in Israel and so much to explore, and in such a small area. Now, I'm hiking from east to west of Israel right now. It's only 50 miles, not including the length of the Kinneret Lake see. In some places Israel is only 10 or 15 miles wide, Israel. As I mentioned earlier, I'm hiking this on the weekend of Easter, Pesach, Passover, and Ramadan. Everything is shut down in Israel this weekend. But I've seen a bunch of people hiking so far. One of the things I wanted to say about that is that because all these different high holy days are coming together, 
on the same time, there's a lot of tension in Israel right now. Five to ten terrorist attack in Israel in the last few weeks, I think seven. Shootings happen in America all the time, many more than here. It's I actually feel safer here than in America. The difference is that here it's innocent people who die, which is really sad. Anyways, there's been a very high military and police presence around the country since the attacks have started. I, I do feel safe. It doesn't make me feel less safe. It makes me feel like I'm protected by them. Uh, and when you're out in nature, it's much harder for anybody to come do something to me out here. I'm not really worried about being alone out here. I'm being cautious, but I'm not changing my plans. I'm not going to let anybody scare me into changing my plans. We have to keep living life when things are going wrong. And that's easier said than done from an American perspective, but these people have been doing it for decades, centuries, and millennia. This has been uh, happening every few hundred meters, I would say. There's like a large stair climb and then there'll be like a few of these at a time. And then the rest of it will be either flat or a slight incline or sometimes a slight decline. But it gets very steep in places. I even took a ladder once today. I'm about eight miles in today so far and I thought I had climbed a bit but I just looked at the elevation change. So I started around negative 600 feet and of sea level and now I'm at plus 300. And today I think I have to go to around plus 4,000-ish. Got quite a bit of climbing to still do. It looks like there might be some reliable water in about four miles. And if not, there's a campground in six miles. Got about a liter and a half left, so I should be fine making it there. Although, like I said, this elevation change is no joke now. I haven't really started going up yet uh, since I just started walking again a minute ago. Just took a break for about 30 minutes, had some snacks, sat in the shade, and recouped. So I'm going to try to push forward the next four miles or so to the water now. For the last mile or so, I have been going up a lot of rock scrambles, probably 30 so far. Judging by the elevation map, it looks like I will probably be continuing that for the next 15 miles or so. So I've slowed it way down now, taking a lot more breaks. There's 30 second breaks like this one, catching my breath in the shade, then pounding out a few more scrambles up. The trail's pretty well kept, so that's good. And there's, uh, there's like metal posted into the stone where you need to use it. It's just a lot of elevation change. I'm very tired. I need a good night of sleep, which I will definitely get tonight. This difficult hiking is not for nothing though. I've been getting outstanding views the entire time of this river valley. Here's just a little peak. And there has been a constant source of water for the last mile or so. It's getting even stronger. And I actually just stumbled upon a nice sized waterfall here. It looks like it's about 20 feet. It's right there. So I'll, I'll be going down there. I think the trail looks like it's going down there. I don't know if I want to filter this water or not. It, it does look a little bit dirty and I don't quite need it yet. So I might try and wait for a more, uh, for actually a tap source at a campground. I've got about a liter left now. This hiking is really difficult. So I might just load some up in the pouch and hold on to it if I need it. The reason why I'm questioning using this water is because there's been a lot of people with like leaving poop and toilet paper near the trail. And I'm sure the further I get up, the less of that there will be and the cleaner the source will be. I'm just a little bit wary of using water that has poop within, you know, a couple hundred feet of the trail like this. Well, just about the luckiest thing possible just happened to me. I walked up to a man and his son. He was a surgeon. He saw me struggling a little, going uphill, struggling a lot. And he gave me a bottle of frozen water half frozen water. It was like manna from a heaven. Talked to him for about 10 minutes just now. Very nice guy. And whenever I say, oh, I'm sorry, do you speak English? People say shalom. I say, shalom, I'm sorry, do you speak English? They say, of course I speak English. So he did his residency in Europe as a surgeon. He's traveled all over the world. He went to Toronto 
and now he's back here. He loves it here. And he was just really looking out for me. He was telling me how much water I was gonna need for the rest of the hike up. He said it's a very hard hike, continuing all the way. Just really lucky to be here and to meet amazing people like him. Just took a break for about 10 minutes here. I came to a crossing and now I think I'm about to keep going. I got about four miles left to the campsite. Uh, this, this might be the hardest trail I've done. I don't know why I'm not feeling good. It's not that I don't feel good. I think it's just the heavy pack, it's all uphill. There's no downhill anymore until I'm halfway done. It's like 20 miles of uphill. I'm hoping I can make it to that campsite before it gets dark so that like the people will be there to sell me the campsite for the night. I can't quite pin it, but these flowers have the most amazing smell and it smells just like a tea that's popular. Uh, I can't, I don't, I don't know the name of it. They're filling the entire air though. Came upon another one of these buildings. They look pretty abandoned, I'd say. Ah, there's a wheel in there. Some kind of water powered device. Wow. Judging by the way these arches were made and then remade, this place is old. I would camp in here if I had to though. This ain't the worst spot. Unfortunately, I've been really struggling these last few miles and I haven't quite filmed everything that I wanted to for you or to record for myself for later. And uh, lots of really cool water crossings though. And then there was a bunch more of those old ancient looking buildings. I'm not actually sure how old they are, but they have this irrigation system that diverts water into the building it looks like. It might be some like uh, type of cistern system. Uh, I I'm definitely gonna have to read about it after this trip. Currently I'm standing at uh, another cool bridge though. I just walked up on a pretty large boar about 25 feet away from me and it saw me first and it started running away but it seems like it's sitting just up the hill here maybe just 30 feet i can hear it panting and after i saw it i started backing away and i slipped on a rock and then i fell on my tailbone onto a rock so my tailbone's okay but it hurts pretty bad I'm not bleeding or anything Definitely gonna have to take some Advil tonight. Uh, I'm just a little nervous getting around this corner now with the boar right there. I'm gonna have to take it slow. I got my hiking poles out to wave them around if necessary or try and poke the thing if it tries to charge me. I did have uh, two babies with it, so that it, it may its home may be right there and trying to defend it. So I'm just gonna uh, keep facing that area as I walk up and then walk back. I'm just about a mile and a half now from the campsite, so I can make it there once I get by this obstacle. <laughs> 